All right, here we go. This is so exciting. Brad Thor, New York Times number one best-selling author, joining us here for our very first author interview on our Larry O'Connor Locals page for the book club. Brad, thank you so much for joining us here. This is fabulous. Oh, you guys are old friends. I'm happy to do this and uh, I'm honored to be the first. So thank you. This is Black Ice. Your book is out just this week, already tearing it up. My God. Uh, Let's start with the whole process here of selling a book post COVID, the yeah. timing, how you do a book tour and all that, because you're still selling. I've seen the numbers on Amazon, but is, is it weird and disorienting to have to sort of go through the, the new normal? I, what I did was two virtual events because last year I did like 14 virtual events. It's just that we realized people have got Zoom fatigue and yeah. it's silly to do 14 events because you give people two choices. I, so I did something Monday night and then I did something Tuesday night. And the Monday night was via uh, the wonderful people at the Poison Pen in Scottsdale, great independent bookstore. Uh, it was free to everybody. And then the next night, Tuesday night, we selected 13 lovely independent bookstores and did it as a ticketed event because we wanted to support them. So if you bought the book from one of those bookstores, you got a code to get into that. And then I had uh, a, a, a friend from the Spy Game uh, interview me. And so that, that was a nice, nice thing to do. Well, the book is selling great despite all of the, you know, the, the new ways of promoting it. Obviously, you are tireless for your fans. You get yourself out there. <laughs> It is black ice. Uh, yeah, I, I do feel like you write your your book sort of in like uh, two or three or four book chunks. You know, they there there is yeah. sort of a, a a through line in some of them. Yeah. Um, and and I've noticed in the last several books, uh, there regionally, geographically, there's definitely a through line there in terms yeah. of these these cold weather northern European sort of environments, which um is frankly very unique and creative. Not a lot of people, you know, everyone likes to write about, you know, intrigue in the Caribbean and the Mediterranean, right? right? right. Um, but th this is a very uh, unique and distinct region of the world that doesn't get a lot of attention. Uh, talk to me about what drew you to it and also what kind of research you w went into it. The fact that uh, Norway is a NATO ally is was a huge thing for me because Sweden's kind of like half pregnant. They got it's like the hokey pokey. They got one foot in, one foot out. They're not a full NATO member. Finland is not. Um, and I when I heard that there was a secret cave complex in Norway, and I put this a couple summers ago in Spymaster, that we store a ton of military equipment in. I was like, oh, this is so cool. I've got to look at this and figure out how to weave this into a book. And then they also have a border with Russia. It's a really big yeah. deal. So the, uh, the, the, the radar station at Vardo is legit. It's real. It's right there pointed at the Russian Northern fleet. It was just an exciting place. So I went over to Norway, uh, did a bunch of research in Oslo. I was going to squeeze a couple of books out of that research. And then I wanted to go back uh, and to go up uh, uh, above the Arctic Circle uh, and go to Svalbard, the archipelago and all this kind of stuff. And I got just COVID ruined that. So yeah. that the trip got scrapped because they 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 shut down everywhere in Europe. And the the governor uh, there uh, for the archipelago easy to just say no ships, no planes, nothing, nothing coming in. So what's really nice is Jim uh, Jim Carafano at the Heritage Foundation yeah. is a really good buddy of mine, and uh, they've got an awesome guy on staff there that has written tons about the malign influence of Russia and the Arctic and why we need to be watching Russia. And I said, Jim, would you introduce me to Luke Coffee? And he's like, Oh my God, Luke's the best guy, absolutely. I said, You think he'd, he'd let me pick his brain a little bit? He's like, Totally. Oh, so great. Jim Carafano at Heritage hooked me up with Luke Coffee, and then Coffee was so nice. He's like, Brad how many photos would be too many for me to send you of my time on Svalbard? And I'm like, there aren't too many. Yeah, no me. such thing. No such thing. I, I mean, because yeah. it's like I learned from Luke that the Russians have a consulate there and all this other kind of stuff. And that the, the cell phones, if you switch them on, it goes onto a Russian tower and wow. all this cool stuff. So super nice. It's about these indigenous people that you that you're at, forget their the name. Sammy. Oh, thank you. Uh, they welcome. saved Scott's life when he was, you know, uh, lost in that region and going on it. And I love that storyline. And they come back again. Uh, again, yeah. again, no one knows about this, uh, this part of the world and these people. Um, tell me a little bit more about them, because they sound like these heroic, heroic, anti-Russian proud people who sort of carve their own way. I want to hang with them. They, they're, they're, they're incredible. 
they're they're pretty cool and so they enjoy because they're a, a large source of income for them next to tourism is uh they're reindeer herders and so because they're the indigenous people in that area they're allowed to kind of cross from you know into to sweden and finland there's this whole thing and, and yeah. so they get a lot of latitude uh, but what's interesting is that whole thing about wanting uh the chinese wanting to do a train from kirkenes yeah. in the north of norway down into finland that's legit that's real and it got and, killed and, because of the, the who, reindeer herding yeah who who planted the the story about you know, that the chinese so Solvi, that's what harvath liked when he heard that somebody planted a piece of disinformation that the chinese were trying to get a wasting disease going in the reindeer <laughs> yes. to get the sammy out that's of the business great. he's like that's pretty clever and then he realizes you know, with Solvi kolstad i wanted to create a character as good if not better skill set wise than Harvath. And I say the only yeah. thing he's got on her is experience. And it's because he's been at it longer. Other than that, she's smarter, yeah. faster, funnier. I just, I liked creating somebody who could be his equal, if not his better. One more question on this. And that has to do with these nuclear powered icebreakers. Again, something that you don't hear about much whenever you hear about the competitive nature of our naval forces and uh, the need for, you know, keeping pace with China and Russia with submarines and 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 aircraft carriers and our naval superiority you don't hear about this you know we don't have we are actually closer to the arctic with alaska and have more yep. interest there than china does and yet we right. have no nuclear powered icebreakers this is a uh, was that a Robert O'Brien seed that was planted there? So, I know so, that you're friends with our former national security advisor. So Robert O'Brien and I have been friends since college. I've known him since college, I yeah. should say. So anyway, yeah, we have two icebreakers. One caught fire and now it's basically, you know, for parts. Uh, we've got only one uh, left and I always screw up the names and where they're based. But the one operational one is used to support our research center that's down in Antarctica. So that's what that one exists to do is to is to resupply that and all that kind of stuff. So Mike Pompeo, the former secretary of state, admitted we were behind the curve uh, in the Arctic, that we didn't realize this was going to become such a big, important thing because I, I, no comment on climate change. The fact is, is that the sea ice is melting in the Arctic. OK, for whatever reason, temperatures are rising twice as fast there than anywhere else on the planet. So the sea ice is melting, which means that there are these incredible pockets of minerals, oil, natural gas that are up for grabs. Yeah. The Russians, like I said in the book, they planted a flag on the seafloor at the North Pole. They're trying to convince people that they own all of this prop, all of this space up there. It really is the new Cold War. And as I talked, so... Uh, Yes, Robert O'Brien was very, very helpful, pointing me towards articles and stuff. There's only so much he could do while he was acting national security advisor. So of course, he had to be yeah. careful what he told me, but he pointed me in some very good directions. And we had a lot of phone conversations, non-classified stuff. I, I, I just love that, again, this is what sets you apart. I love that this is such a unique and, and, and you know, uncharted territory, this kind of thing, and the shipping lanes in the Arctic and how that is a very real thing and it's ripped from the headlines. At the moment in this book, in Black Ice, when, you know, everything's great and we're seeing Scott and he's in love and he's doing his thing with his Norwegian babe and everything. And then the moment he sees that ghost, the man he thought he had killed in China, uh, come out of that car and start walking. I, I swear to God, Brad, in my mind, I heard a soundtrack. I heard, oh, you know, it's wow. like, it's suddenly, it's like, dun, 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 dun. Like you a know, movie, like, yeah. like, I got, You could tell that it was, uh, here we go. Here we go. And now we're on, we're in pace. And now here we, and he starts following him through the streets. What's really interesting about that scene and he loses the guy and then sees yeah. the woman at the ATM, right? So that yeah. actually comes out of a screenwriting book called Save the Cat. Uh, and it's a great book and it talks about, and I'm going to give you an example from a Pacino movie. Um, it talks about setting up a scene as early as possible with your protagonist that makes the protagonist likable. And this is a book I read a few years ago. And I like this idea of save the cat, meaning do something heroic, do something noble and good so that, you know, the people in the theater like the main character or the people reading your book, like the main character and the film example they used, I was like, God, that's the 
perfect example was, uh, it, and it's a thriller that I love, Sea of Love with Ellen Barkin and Al Pacino. Okay. Uh, and it's sure, about yeah. a serial killer and that would play the record, uh, that come with me, the sea of love. So in the beginning of that movie, they actually focus on a legit NYPD sting where guys that have not showed up in court, they yes, send them letters that. that you've won tickets to the opening day, uh, for the Yankees. And that if yeah. you come down to the Hilton, it'll be in the grand ballroom for breakfast. You'll get your tickets. We're going to have Yankees serving you pancakes and all this kind of stuff. And they actually got some Yankees to come the NYPD. And then they get all of these miscreants in a room, lock the doors and arrest them all. Yeah. And it's a great thing. So Al Pacino's lying about which Yankee he is and people think they know him and all this kind of stuff. So they got all these idiots in the room and they're about to padlock the doors. Pacino steps out into the hallway to kind of take a look. And there's one guy huffing and puffing, this big fat guy coming and he's late uh, for his tickets, but he's got his little boy with him and he's holding the little boy's hand. And Al Pacino realizes probably not a good thing to see your dad get arrested like this. So Pacino very subtly moves the lapel of his coat and shows his detective shield. And the guy goes, oh, and then he mouths, thank you. And Pacino goes, catch you later. So it's yeah. like the perfect save that you loved Pacino at, in, as that character at that moment. So yeah. that's why I did the whole, I, I did the whole ATM thing because I wanted you to see, the, 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 if you were a brand new reader, I wanted you to see how Harvest moral compass was, uh, was, yeah oriented but i also wanted the threat of harvath maybe not being able to get back into norway and that's really going to be the only way solvi's busy as hell i mean she's making time out of her busy schedule to come home and eat eat with them and then go back to the office yeah. they're not going to hook up as i said you know on some beach in bali or whatever he's going to have to come back to oslo to see her and if he's barred from the country it's going to make that relationship. So it was just a way to add a little bit more uh, jeopardy into yeah. the story. No, it was great. Also, by the way, uh, the ATM scene, a lot of hand to hand there. And yeah. Scott, I mean, listen, Scott is obviously, you know, skilled with any kind of combat and any kind of issue, but he's, he's always been a real weapons guy and a gun guy. Um, it seems like he's doing more hand to hand. Are you, are you trying, I mean, are you, is that a conscious choice? It's a conscious choice. It reflects a little bit of the training I've done. And there is, uh, I'm not going to mention his name on this podcast. Uh, but, uh, so there is a, there is a Japanese samurai, uh, martial arts art form that I got into. And I was blown away with that. There's only a handful of people who teach this in the United States, um, I, I went, uh, they had a big seminar and the guy who does the weapons for John wick was in there. So like the weapons, oh my murder. God, I uh, so I got so to, jealous. Uh, the, oh. he's a big, so he got me into no more Levi's and he got me into stretch fabric jeans, uh, a little bit of stretch like several years ago. Cause he's like, this is how you can actually do all the moves we're learning and everything. But just to talk John wick with him was really cool. So uh, anyway, uh, this instructor, uh, teaches SEALs. He teaches the Delta Force guys. He's very much a, uh, because the art form, the samurai art form is called Namiru. And it was all about uh, fighting with a sword or empty handed, but the movements were the same. And I, I talk about it like, Jeff, it's like something out of Star Wars. It's like the force where you can actually like the instructor said, Brad, come over here. You got a big mouth. You like to run the mouth during class. He was doing a, a, a seminar here in Nashville and he would just disappear on me. Like, he's like, come at me. And one second he was there and the next second I was on the floor. I couldn't find him. I mean, he didn't literally disappear, but the way it was, the, it's the cleverest art form. So I've yeah. incorporated a little bit of that into Harvath because I really, really like that. Yeah. So if I'm doing hand-to-hand -hand stuff, I'm reaching out to this instructor who's teaching the SEALs and teaching the Delta Force guys and all that kind of stuff because gotcha. it's 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 next level. It's well, Nami Ru is the coolest freaking art form I've ever seen. What's the latest on the movie front, Brad? Sometimes the best deal is the deal you do not make. So I've had multiple options. We've had screenplays written, new executives have come in and wiped the slate clean and started over. I joke that it's like lions uh, on the savannah. Uh, a new male comes in and kills all the cubs and starts over again. We now have a deal at a major studio. This started with an unbelievable executive producer. And uh, he said, who would you want to direct? And I said, well, what are my choices? He goes, 
The world's your oyster. I love the fact, you know, listen, we're a very news-oriented show, news-heavy show in Washington, D.C., so I love the fact that I could sort of orient our conversation, yes, about your book, but about what's really going on in the world right now. And I, and I sort of want to bring it back there to China. Um, we talked a lot about it this morning. That was the thrust of this book and the, and the looming threat from China. I think that is a consistent uh, theme in all of your books, that you recognize the threats to our country through the eyes of Scott Harbath. Um, uh, I, I would just want to thank you for that because I appreciate oh, it. It sure. helps me. It helps me crystallize about what what, what we should be focusing on. Um, but but in that realm, it, it, you made a stylistic choice here. You know, I just read. You mentioned Dan Silva. I just read Dan mm -hmm. Silva's book. That show is just or that show. His book is absolutely um, overcome with COVID talk. There, there's constant conversation about social distancing and masking and, and all of and January 6th and all this yep, stuff. In the and, election, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I do, listen, I always like books that are, that are you know, drawn from the headlines, uh, faction, as you like to say. But frankly, and I would say this to him if I were interviewing him, and, and hopefully I will be able to interview Dan Silva about this. To me, it wasn't the escape I wanted. Uh, and, and, and you made the choice not to go there. Yep. So tell me about that. So, well, first of all, I want the people watching this. Uh, it, it's actually interesting. When I put Larry O'Connor in as the iconic broadcaster, uh, Larry O'Connor, that was my <laughs> book, Code of Conduct, from several years ago that dealt with a global pandemic. From China. And, yeah. Or, uh, well, uh, no, Africa. Yeah, it from was Africa. African Sorry. hemorrhagic from fever. Africa. So I, I, I started it in Africa, but it was all about a pandemic. I've had so many people read that book during COVID and go, how did you know? Yeah. How did you know all this stuff? And I'm, so that, that's very interesting. Um, you know, it's funny because I've been asked about, I, I haven't read The Cellist, so I haven't seen it. Daniel's new book, but I did see some media that talked about uh, he was touting as one of his uh, one of his uh, just one of his points. He was hitting this this note that uh, he had decided to go back and rewrite some of it after the January sixth insurrection. Yeah. So I, I chose I, I choose very carefully how much real world gets in. I never wrote about Bin Laden because I knew eventually we'd capture or kill him. So I never wanted, I don't want to date my books. You can go back and read lines of Lucerne and it will feel it's evergreen. I want the books to stand alone and stand the test of time. So I really try to avoid uh, specific uh, things happening right now. I, I will tell you about the threats and what's going on in the world, uh, but I still want the book to feel fresh five, 10 years from now, particularly for somebody who's been in the business 20 years with 21 books. I, I want that to be, I, I, yeah. you could pick up any Brad Thor book and it doesn't feel dated. So, but yeah. authors make decisions based on what gets them excited, right? So uh, that's very animating. It's tough to write a book. It's, it, it's tough for Daniel Silva. It's tough for me. You know, I, I even believe it's tough for Stephen King and Stephen King has a different world that he works in versus me or somebody like a Daniel Silva. Daniel Silva and I have very specific, Jack Carr, let's use that. That's even better comparison. So Jack Carr and I have very specific rules that we have to adhere to. Somebody dies, they're dead. You don't get to put them in the pet cemetery and they come back. You know, Stephen King can warp and bend reality and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, but I made a conscious choice not to cover COVID. And I did that a couple, when I was doing my media tour last summer for that book, people said, what about the next book? Is COVID going to be there? I said, hell no, nobody wants to read about COVID. Yeah. I want to imagine a, my universe is continuing without COVID. We're going to get to the point where everybody's cool and, and it's fully back to normal and no lockdowns and all that kind of stuff. Why would you, for me, I don't want to do that to my readers. I want to give them the full escape. Uh, other authors may have a, a different calculus, but for me, I don't want to, you're trying to get away from that stuff. And yeah. I'm going to give you the escape. We appreciate that as your, as your fans and as your readers. Get Black Ice, it rocks, and, and get it as gifts for everybody as well. Thanks, Brad.